Welcome to a special episode of Conduct Detrimental. Dan Lust, Dan Wallach, we are recapping the congressional hearing into the Washington Commander's Toxic Workplace and Sexual Harassment Investigation. Dan, a long three and a half hours on the video feed. We thank everyone that tuned in live. We had about 2,500 people um, over the cross of the feed, the conduct cast, first ever. Dan, what are your thoughts on the hearing today? Well, it was the quickest three and a half hours of my life. I mean, anytime you have Roger Goodell testifying for the first time before Congress, a live cross-examination for the first time in 15 years, it's riveting. You know, all these questions beg more questions, and he didn't adequately answer a number of them, the most important of which was, why can't you just redact the names of witnesses and release a redacted report to protect the identity of anyone who doesn't want their information out there? And then that would satisfy, you know, both of those concerns. And then, of course, the big one was his uh, sort of fib that he doesn't have the power to remove Dan Snyder from the roles of the NFL ownership. Well, that's that that's not exactly true. What he should have said is, I can't dictate it, but I can make a recommendation pursuant to my powers in the NFL Constitution and bylaws and make that recommendation to the NFL Executive Committee, which would then have to give Snyder notice and an opportunity to be heard and could remove him and force a sale of his ownership interest on three quarters vote of the remaining NFL owners. So three fourths out of 31 can force a sale. So Roger Goodell is not exactly powerless here. He had the ability and he did in fact discipline Dan Snyder in this case to the tune of $10 million you know, organizational fine. He disciplined Robert Kraft in, in connection with Deflategate. So Roger Goodell is no potted plant here. He certainly had much more uh, discretion to just simply say, you know, hey, my hands are, you know, I can't, I can't do anything here, I'm powerless. That's a lie. So let's paint a little bit of a picture for those that did not join us, you know, for those two and a half or three and a half hours of fun. We started the day. Um, we want to thank just briefly our guests uh, that joined us for the, for the feed. We had Denton Day uh, from 106.7 The Fan in D.C. We had Pete Medhurst at 980, Washington, D.C. two sports radio stations over there. And we had Andrew Brandt, who uh, is a professor at Villanova Law School, also a uh, former executive with the Green Bay Packers. So we had a pretty nice guest list today. So we previewed the hearings and essentially said one of three things would happen. Roger Goodell would spend the entire time deflecting and not answering anything. That was kind of door one. Door number two is he would throw the commanders under the bus. And door number three was that he would throw Dan Snyder under the bus. So we ended up somewhere between door number one and door number two. He largely deflected, but which we'll get into. There was a brief moment where he did throw the commanders under the bus. And uh, before we bury the lead, we're going to be joined on the show by Megan Imbert, a former guest on Conduct Detrimental. She's a former employee with the Washington Commanders. But Dan, you and I asked her about these questions. We asked her about the parts of the hearing that made her feel gross and got her really upset in them. And the moments of the hearing where there was some hope that maybe Dan Snyder would be punished, maybe there would be some thought that he would sell the team. But I think by and large, Dan, 95% of the hearing, uh, you know, was filibusters from politicians that did not want to have this topic discussed on Capitol Hill. And again, just for those new listeners, we are not a political podcast, but we call it like we see it. Dan Snyder, uh, you know, uh, we had Pete Medhurst on our live feed. who was explaining that Snyder leans to the right and the politicians who also lean to the right were very much, you know, trying to derail the conversation saying, why are we talking about this sports specific issue? And then you had the left coming back and said, you know, th- this is a hearing that's not about sports culture, about sports employment culture. It's about all workplaces across the country. And maybe, and I'm paraphrasing, we can make an example and put a spotlight of what's going on in Washington. But the larger goal here is to help workplaces all across the country and not having NDAs to silence employees who might want to speak out against the employer. So, you know, that's, we can get into kind of the substance. We'll do a lot of that with Megan. We'll recap it. Dan, that, that, that's a vital point that you just made, that the focus of the committee's work isn't drilling down only for the purpose of shining a spotlight on the Washington commanders. This is part of the permissible role of Congress to just uh, look at existing laws and propose laws and look for sort of defects in our legal system for the purpose of remedying them. And when you frame the issue along those sort of macro lines, it's a legitimate congressional scope of inquiry. But Dan Snyder is going to argue the opposite thing when, if and when he's subpoenaed. And we'll cover this sort of after, the, after Megan's interview. 
But Snyder's going to ask or pose the question in court that this isn't related to the le- legitimate task of Congress. Congress is supposed to pass laws. Look at the sufficiency of laws for purposes of, you know, remedying them. And, you know, the, there has to be a valid legislative purpose. This can't be an inquisition. They can't be acting as sort of prosecutors. That's the function of the executive branch or the judicial branch, not the legislative branch. And that's going to be teed up. Yeah, I was going to say not everybody got that memo today because yeah, there was yeah, definitely it, it, some people pretending to be prosecutors and cross-examining today. Yeah, I mean, I have it right here. You know, Donald Trump is going to surface over and over and over again in any ensuing federal court battle because when his accounting firm was subpoenaed you know, to deliver or produce tax returns to Congress that belong to the president, that spawned, you know, this multi-court litigation, which led to some, you know, very important precedent uh, regarding the scope of congressional inquiry and a, you know, sort of an examination of private individuals or even the president. And, you know, a congressional subpoena, I mean, I'm going to, this bears repeating, because while Congress's investigative power is broad and almost unfettered, it's not unlimited. Their subpoena power is valid only if it is related to and in furtherance of a legitimate task of the Congress. The subpoena must serve a valid legislative purpose. It must concern a subject on which legislation could be had. That's right out of the Supreme Court's ruling in Trump versus Mazar's USA, and it ties right into the point that you made in that the purpose of this hearing was to, to, was to sort of remedy the issue regarding, you know, workplace misconduct and the stated use of purpose. NDAs, right, right. stated purpose. So they're, they're walking a very thin line here, or they're straddling this line between legitimate congressional purpose and potentially having this be a prosecution. You know, there were comments, which we expected, right? We expected the comments that would be do, I don't know, disruptive, but it was a whole set of questions on race norming in the NFL. And the politician that asked the question said, I've been dying to ask Roger Goodell questions. And it was like, okay, it's an important issue, the race norming issue, which, you know, I I don't want to make light of it all, but it doesn't have very much to to do with today. So, and then we uh, got derailed on inflation rates and gun control and a whole host of issues that had nothing to do, you know, with the hearing today. And also, you know, maybe an important issue, but, you know, the name Dave Portnoy came up and the question was asked to Roger Goodell, why is Dave Portnoy banned from NFL games? And, you know, Roger Goodell said, I'm not aware of that issue. So we had some fun with it, some tongue in cheek stuff. But, you know, if the stated purpose is really to help workplace, you know, culture, Dave Portnoy has very little to do with it, right? Larry Nasser, who was the, you know, the the old uh, USA gymnastics coach who's uh, serving time in prison now for his role in, you know, his kind of gross allegations. He came up a number of times, but that did not occur in any type of workplace, right? Those were important sports allegations, but not really relevant to today. So, Dan Snyder was one person who was brought up a lot. He's certainly relevant, but he was not there. Dan Snyder was uh, away, I think, at the at some type of film festival in France. He very conveniently was unable to attend either in person uh, or on Zoom. Certainly very important to attend. But I think at least, Dan, I, I don't know, I think we should spend some time in this. There is an oddity, right? Roger Goodell and Dan Snyder were both asked to voluntarily appear in front of Congress. One of them did. One of them did not. Roger Goodell did not answer a subpoena today. So I think the legal strategy that the NFL was employing this protect the shield unified front. Let's throw Goodell to the wolves. That's his job. Protect the shield. Right. Let him answer the hard hitting questions. And that'll give us some indication of who and what is going to be asked of Dan Snyder when he is ultimately subpoenaed. So that was my read on it. Why one came and why the other one didn't didn't come because they wanted to have some type of staggered approach to get kind of the questions in advance. That was my read on it. My read is that Dan Snyder is trying to run out the clock. And he had What's his the clock, though? What's the, the, the clock? clock? Is a, the election? clock is election day. The clock is election mm-hmm. day. And if and when he's subpoenaed, which will be, what, what July 1st or June 30th, he's going to file a federal court lawsuit in the District of Columbia asserting that this congressional inquiry exceeds the scope of a legitimate congressional purpose, which is you know just lawmaking and not to conduct these prosecutions or inquisitions or to target individuals like him. And you know just by filing the lawsuit, we saw what happened in the, in the, in the, uh, in the impeachment proceedings. They were trying to get these tax returns. And they were trying to get witnesses to testify and the te- and, and the witnesses asserted their like executive privilege. And, you know, they ran out the clock 
on the impeachment proceedings and in large part were successful because it was a very narrow time window. Here with the commander's investigation, we're already in, in the, into the summertime almost. The election is around the corner. And if there's a change of the guard, if there is a new majority that favors the Republicans and you know they become a little bit more entrenched in all three branches or two of the three branches of the government, that could really spell you know sort of the death knell for this congressional investigation. So I think the strategy here for Dan Snyder is delay, delay, delay. When you get issued the subpoena, he's obviously not gonna wait to be held in contempt of Congress. I mean, who wants that? I mean, when you're, when you're litigating cases in a civil trial system and there's a subpoena which is legally impermissible, you don't wait for the judge to hold the deponent in contempt. You file a motion to quash the subpoena. So I would expect we're about to enter the new legal frontier of Dan Snyder challenging the validity of, of the subpoena and the validity of this congressional committee's oversight into areas that may go beyond the purview of a proper legislative purpose. And I'm gonna read one more quote from another Donald Trump decision against, it's Trump versus Deutsche Bank. I mean, this was during a period 2019, 20, 21. Everybody's trying to get his records. You know, loan, loan documents, tax returns, and the Second Circuit, quoting the U.S. Supreme Court, said that when Congress conducts investigations in aid of legislation, its authority derives from its responsibility to legislate, to consider the enactment of new laws or the improvement of existing ones for the public good, but it may not seek information to enforce laws or to punish for their infraction responsibilities which belong to the executive and judicial branches respectively and not to it. So no inquiry is an end in itself. It must be related to and in furtherance of a legitimate task of Congress, investigations conducted solely for the personal aggrandizement of the investigators or to punish those investigated are quote unquote indefensible. That's Trump versus Deutsche Bank AG, Second Circuit decision in 2019, citing SCOTUS. That's going to be front and center in Dan Snyder's legal challenge to this subpoena. Dan, I think on that, uh, let's uh, we'll kick it over to our guest, Megan. One point I want to give you credit for before we give it over to Megan. And, and Megan, uh, again, she's joined us before with another former employee of the Washington Commanders, Megan Imbert. That was a, uh, a former employee, Anna Nunez. Those two together joined myself and Stephanie Weisenberger on a previous episode of the show. You can find that in our archives. But um, Dan, you mentioned a couple of times, which is why I think it was a great opportunity to have Megan on. A lot has been made by Roger Goodell that they could not release the full findings of any type of commander's report, hashtag release the report, because there were certain employees that they, they wanted to have their information and their names kept private and confidential. Now, there is certainly another sect of employees, and Megan and Anna, Anna are, are part of that group, that are open and honest and have been transparent with their allegations. So. A lot of times you were saying it every time it would come up during the hearing, you know, Roger Goodell can't say that privacy is the reason that these things is being withheld because Dan, as, as you know, and I know you were tweeting about it last night, separate case, you know, the, in the Brian Flores case, you know, the NFL exchanges documents, they redact everything, right, other than the arbitration clause, and then they exchange those documents, right? So why can't we do that here? Redact all the information and anything indirect information that you could help identify the person that wants to be kept private. And let the information out of those that, that want the information to be public. These people don't, don't want to be hidden. They, they want their stories out there. Megan is doing media appearances up and down. Megan's coming on this podcast because she wants her story to be told. So I, I think of all the things I was kind of annoyed at Roger Goodell at today, I think by and large he did a good job. But the fact that he kept saying over and over, we can't release it because of privacy concerns. That's only answering half the question. So again, I, I don't know. I'll give it. Do you have any brief thoughts on that before we go to Megan? Yeah, I mean, Representative Raskin asked uh, Goodell today, "Why don't you just relate, redact the names and release the right. report?" And this was Goodell's answer, which is at variance with, with what the league is doing in the Flores case. His answer is, "Redaction doesn't always work in my world." <laughs> well, it what works in the, Well, it works in the Flores case. I I, I I saw copies listed as exhibits, all the employment agreements right. Of, right. Uh, of, of Steve Wilkes, Ray Horton, um, uh, Brian Flores. And I got to tell you, those agreements are largely redacted. Everything is redacted except for the arbitration language. I have no idea what those other provisions say, nor will I ever be able to figure it out. So in, in, in the Flores world, 
uh, redaction works. I don't know what world he's talking about where redactions don't work. I mean, you and I have litigated hundreds of cases in our lifetimes, and, and there are confidentiality, confidentiality stipulations that are entered, so ordered by the court. We, we, we redact documents and exchange them in litigation uh, fairly frequently, and it's a common practice and we have no idea what's behind the black you can't read it you know what he, that's why it's called the redaction meant? yeah i think he meant that he doesn't know how to use adobe acrobat because the, the real way to redact <laughs> right you redact in the app then you print it out and then you scan it through you can't see through that i want to stand as a as an interesting side story i once had a cop uh one of my cases sent send me something that was intended to be redacted but he literally did the redactions in adobe so a little bit of a pro tip always check it out if you highlight it over the redacted part and you did a cut and paste and put it into a Word document, I could see all the stuff that was redacted. So not a smart move on uh, behalf of that unnamed police officer who will not be mentioned on the show. Okay, Dan, so Megan Ebert, she's on social media at Megan, M-E-G-A-N-I-M-B-E-R-T. So with that said, Dan, I think we can kick it over to our conversation with Megan Ebert. Welcome back to the 24-hour telethon known as Conduct Detrimental NFL Style. We've been covering Deshaun Watson, special episode following the settlement of his lawsuits. We did a live, first ever live Conduct Con or Conduct... Uh, conduct Cast. Conduct, conduct Cast, cast uh, podcast live for three and a half hours. And now we're back today with sort of a wrap-up of today's con congressional hearing. And we're honored to have back with us today a one-time guest of Conduct Detrimental, uh, an instrumental figure in the Washington football sort of saga, Megan Imbert. Uh, Megan, welcome back to Contact Instrumental. For the benefit of our audience, can you give us a little bit of a background as to who you are and where you kind of fit into the puzzle? Happy to. Thank you again for having me. So my story was, I was originally an intern with the team in 2006 to 2007 in public relations and then the television department working under Larry Michael. And then I was hired full time in 2008. And I left on my own accord in 2011 during the lockout. So my role in, in this whole two years was when I first saw the original article in um, July of 2020 with Emily Applegate, I was then inspired to come forward originally anonymously about my experiences. And it was shortly thereafter that first article that I learned of the explicit videos that my television department under Larry Michael uh, produced for owner Dan Snyder. And once I learned that, I said, put my name on this. And I've been on record ever since. I am disgusted. I'm angry. And ever since then, helped out with the Wilkinson investigation, Congress, you name it. However, I can get more voices adding, adding their experiences. So you, you spoke with Beth Wilkinson in connection with her review and investigation of the Washington commander's workplace. So yes, I was a participant. Are you less disgusted or more disgusted after today's congressional hearing and testimony slash inquisition of NFL commissioner Roger Goodell? I'm not surprised by Roger Goodell's testimony today. I expected some of his answers. I have my own set of questions that I wish that they would have addressed. Like what? Um, one of the ones that originally uh, created the mistrust that I have with the NFL was why did they allow the Snyders to get 100% ownership of this team while there was an investigation going on about Dan Snyder? That's question number one to me. Also, it is extremely disheartening today to hear repeatedly Roger Goodell state that he thinks Dan Snyder has been held accountable. If that's the case, then why does he have Mary Jo White also doing an investigation? So I think there was um, a bit of hypocrisy. We noticed, um, I love the, the slide that came up on the 243 page deflate gate report, the testimony around Miami Dolphins and how they redacted names. So I think there were a few roadblocks for Roger Goodell um, today. That, that happened. Similarly, I didn't feel like anyone straight up asked him, what were the findings? You know, like, I think there were some basic questions that were, were forgotten. I have a quick one. I mean, and you, you hit on it. It's almost like Goodell wants to have his cake and eat it too, right? He's like, we found them responsible. We're holding them accountable. And then the question was asked a couple of times. I would have liked a few more follow-ups, at least from the politicians that were on the ball, not the ones that were filibustering and bringing up nonsense and had nothing to do with anything. But the the point is, if you really have found them responsible and they've been held accountable, why are you continuing to investigate them, right? So 
I guess there, there, there's some things that you don't feel that they've been held accountable for, right? The NFL is certainly a part of this investigation. And I think the other part, Megan, that I, I want to get your thoughts on, Roger Goodell was pretty complimentary of Beth Wilkinson. And, you know, for better or for worse, I think initially the read on the situation was that Wilkinson didn't want to issue the written report. And I think now in hindsight, we've realized that was a decision that was made above her uh, to not have a written report. Now, no one asked this question. And I honestly, I, I'm half joking, but if you put people like Dan and I on the, you know, on the question panel, like, you know, I think we would have asked this. I think it would have been right at the tip of my tongue. Like if Beth Wilkinson did such a good job, right? And she made the recommendation that, that uh, Dan Snyder would get in more trouble than he did. Why did we switch to, you know, Mary Jo White in the middle that's of That's one of my, that's one of my questions, Dan. What, right? Like why would, why would, if she did such a good job, it's great, right? And she did all this work up on the case for like a year. What was the benefit of switching to someone else? Unless you wanted a fresh start, you wanted another bite of the apple. My original, um, I remember, I think I talked to Fox 5 about this, was my thinking is that they didn't want um, her to, she wouldn't whitewash the findings. She likely had solid recommendations. We know that Dave Donovan sued her to try to find out about that 2009 misconduct. Um, We know that she knows all the players. If she really uh, interviewed over 150 people, then you know, she, from, from the common interest agreement. And when Congress found all that out, it looks like Roger Goodell or the league office, um, were the ones that no longer requested an actual written report. So to me right there, that's on Roger Goodell. That's on his office. Where's Lisa Friel, right? Where there were no, there were no questions about the investigators from the league office. I would have loved to see more around that as well. Um, because after, I believe after Lisa Friel talked about how the findings were not on par with what they would consider an owner to be, all of a sudden she's gone radio silent. Let's let's talk about Dave Donovan for a second, because these were the findings that came out yesterday, right? That um, with respect to this 2009 allegation, that Dave Donovan, who at the time was one of the lawyers for the team, he conducted an internal investigation when, according to protocol back in 2009, that should have been handled by the league. So, you know, it didn't come up today at all. Maybe a little bit of whether whether or not, you know, Roger Goodell knew ahead of time. But I think that that incident just speaks to this point of like institutional control, right? It seems like Dave Donovan tried to hide this issue from the league back in 2009. Was that your, your reading of the situation as well? It's it's difficult being in my spot, considering I know these people individually, right? I worked alongside sure. them. I had a good and, work. And Larry Michael, who that clip came Larry out with today. My boss. Yeah. Oh, well, we can talk about that clip separately. That that had me just sobbing. Um, I can't really speak to Dave Donovan's motives, but it definitely appears like it would be a conflict of interest, but I'm not a lawyer. So I don't really feel comfortable talking about that particular question. I think that's definitely an area I'd love for them to dig in more, though. I want to go back to the Beth Wilkinson, you know, recommendation. I mean, there's, it's, it's been rumored for quite a while, and I think a radio station in Washington, D.C. reported that Beth Wilkinson was prepared to recommend that Dan Snyder be forced to sell his interest in the Washington Commanders. I was struck by the fact that nobody on the committee asked Roger Goodell whether Beth Wilkinson was willing or had a particular recommendation. Forget about issuing the report, releasing the report. Did Beth Wilkinson have a recommendation as to the proposed punishment for uh, Washington commanders on the Dan Snyder? I think that was laying out there ready to be sort of slam dunked by somebody, just like why didn't they do redactions on the report and then release the redacted report? Why did nobody, I mean, that would have been one of my first questions. Did Beth Wilkinson have any recommendation? I was actually stunned that that question wouldn't have been asked and then related to that, I would have wanted to know how often did Roger Goodell or his investigators actually talk to the commanders, Snyder, Jason Wright, Greg Rush, um, all those people that are orchestrating the commander's response to all of this. And if you notice, the commanders put out a letter to their employees today on here are the recommendations that Beth Wilkinson had and what we're doing about it. So they're trying to do their PR move now. That's one of the basic questions I certainly would have I thought would have been a softball. And then I'm also curious, and it seemed like from my, from my vantage point, I probably need to listen to Roger again, but he didn't seem very clear or guided on the backdoor common interest agreement. It didn't seem like he really understood that 
this is so the league and the team could talk. And if you go back to timing, I would be very curious to know at what point that date of that agreement coming into place when the majority of these 150 people participate in the investigation, because that's the biggest thing for us. We were not informed of it. We were only informed when Congress released information on it, right? So yeah. I think there's a little bit more there too, as well. I'm also curious, especially if the NFL is privy to the findings or whatever these updates were, I'm very interested to know if other NFL owners have been privy to those findings, who's had access to the actual information that the Wilkinson firm shared. So I'm, I'm curious about those things as well. Okay, we were watching today the Larry Michaels clip in real time. I don't know which Congress congressman or congresswoman introduced the videotape. Had you ever seen that before? Um, how, I mean, what was your reaction to it? I'm actually really glad that I wasn't live streamed. I burst it into tears. I actually like sobbed, cried. It wasn't like tears in my eyes. It was, I was that blonde intern in 2006, in 2007. I worked for this man. I've heard comments like that out of his mouth. And it's, it's disappointing because these situations when you, and it's hard for me to say I'm a victim or a survivor of this, but there is real PTSD and there's things that we suppress and when I watched that clip, I just literally had a visceral reaction that I'm hearing that clip was from like 2019. That's like 13 years removed from when I worked for that guy. And it's really tough. Um, and nothing's changed like over the well, long time horizon, was, the behaviors well, still Michael, are the same behaviors. Larry Michael was rewarded with retirement a few days before the original Washington Post story launched. And I know people are critical of me because there's pictures of me with Larry, even most recently, 2015. Yeah. I didn't know about the videos until 2020. I what can assure La uh, Just can for the benefit of our audience, yeah. what did the, what did the audio, what did Larry say oh. on this video? Uh, Cause not everybody tuned in. Yeah. Live. So the, the audio clip, it was basically when Larry probably thought that either, either he didn't care or, or it was a hot mic basically observing an intern that he thought was pretty and saying suggest I, I have the I have the exact quote if it helps he goes don't leave do anything out Dan <laughs> I know I'm not I, I have it verbatim I do think our intern comma the blonde in the back in the black period I think she's looking freaking pretty good uh, and Roger Goodell's response to that question was this is unacceptable Larry said more than that he had expletives also as another part of that clip but just completely disrespectful. I think Roger was probably stunned. He probably didn't think that they'd show actual evidence of things like that, but that's the reality of this. And if you keep in mind, we were privy to stuff like that daily, right? So if you were to mag the magnitude of those types of comments, not just from Larry, right? It's pretty stunning, but yeah, you know, that's where Goodell's backtracking what he's saying. He's saying, well, that's inappropriate. And it's like, what about everything that came forward with the Wilkinson report? You can't, if we were to present everything that we think would be in that report, or if they read the memo, I'm sure the whole time, you know, Roger, his own morality would have been, this is not ethical. This is not okay. That's where I think they're going to have this. He's going to have an internal conflict, I think. Or Here's a dollar salary. <laughs> yeah. Um, he didn't, he didn't confirm or deny that number. That was, uh, that was fun. There was one portion of the hearing, I know you mentioned, you know, you got upset at the Larry Michael clip and it was disturbing. You know, we, we think, at least uh, on our show, we, we try to go over all the kind of, you know, nooks and crannies of this case and obviously more keeps coming out. That was one thing that I had not seen before. At one point, Roger Goodell said something that I think would probably, that probably made you feel pretty good. Roger Goodell was asked, have you ever seen anything in, with another NFL organization that compared to what you've uncovered and you've seen with the Washington Commanders? And I said on our live stream, I'm like, there's no way he's going to answer this question. And to Goodell's credit, he said, no, I have never seen anything that comes close to what I've seen with the Washington commander. So, they, you know, we predicted ahead of time that Goodell wasn't going to give us much of anything. He wasn't going to throw Snyder under the bus. He wasn't going to throw the commanders under the bus. But with that one statement, he, he kind of has. Right. He's kind of said that the, what has gone on at Washington HQ is unprecedented. That's you know another way to read it. What did you think when you, when you heard those type of comments? I still think it's hollow words because you still have the Snyders in charge of this organization, whether they want to put Jason Wright as a figurehead, if they want to hire the most diverse leadership, you still have that person in power that is not being held accountable. Keep in mind that $10 million fine was to the organization, not to Dan Snyder. 
So he still has not been held accountable. So while, yes, this might be unprecedented and unfounded, it's really hollow words because the consequences don't align with with what he's saying. You heard Roger Goodell testify at great length today, probably the first time any of us has ever observed Commissioner Goodell under something akin to a cross-examination. How did you feel about his, uh, you know, performance today? What would you like, how, how do you assess how he addressed the, the committee's concerns and, and or your concerns? What would you like to say to Roger Goodell if you had the opportunity? Oh, if I had the opportunity to talk to Roger Goodell, <laughs> I mean, we've written him letters, we've done all of that. My biggest thing was I was 19 years old when I started at the then Washington Redskins organization. He has two twin daughters that I think are 20 now. And my biggest plea to him was, I understand what your job is to protect the owners, but at some point, you know, can you have some level of compassion or empathy to think for a second, what if we were your daughters? What if we were your wife? Like, I, I really struggle with the, just the sheer lack of empathy and lack of any kind of protection, even to this day around this shadow investigation, the use of private investigators, all that. These are things that have happened in the past two years. So this is not a changed person. So I really struggle with just the commentary around how he thinks Dan Snyder has been held accountable and also how he acts right now and and the conduct policy and the fact that the conduct policy should be applied to the owners as well. At what point is enough enough? And also, how does this set a precedent for the future? So here's um, one question that I'll give my fellow Dan some credit for. He said at the beginning of this hearing, and he said it a couple of times, you know, to the extent that there are certain employees that want their names to be confidential, the NFL has been relying on that excuse to say, well, we can't release really anything because certain employees don't want these details to become public. But then there are people like yourself and and Nunez, and you can go through the list. Um, You know, a lot of people that are very active and and vocal on social media, you know, former colleagues of yours, past and present with Washington, that are very public about their involvement with the organization. So, you know, Megan, I know Dan asked you what you would say to Roger Goodell. I'll I'll give you a similar question. What would you say to Roger Goodell and the NFL and, and people you know, with the organization that are hiding behind some people wanting to be, you know, remain confidential while others do not. And Dan raised the point a couple of times, right? Just redact the names of the people that want to be kept private and let people like yourself and Ana Nunez and people that have appeared on on our platform that we've engaged with on social media, let the, let their names come out. If they're okay with it, right? Isn't that decision up to you, right? Why is Roger Goodell making that decision for you? It's not about us. It's never been about us. It's been about protecting him, Dan Snyder, the league, it's protecting the other people that might be implicated. None of this is about me, what I went through. It's not about any of us. And we heard Roger Goodell at that owner's meeting talk about protecting us. It's not true. And there's an absolute way of redacting names or even letting us see how how the report would be published. Talk to the individuals. Are you comfortable with this? Is this okay? There's a way to have some level of transparency when it comes to releasing the findings. And fundamentally, it's never been about us. It's been Roger Goodell is protecting the shield. He's protecting Dan Snyder. They're they're protecting each other. And that's all this is. They do not care. They've sent that message loud and clear with, I mean, we had a congressional hearing today about it. It's not about me at all. Megan, are there any individuals, alleged victims who don't want to have their names out there. Just seemingly everybody who's been public on this yeah, says release place. the report. Well, we had over 150 people participate in the Wilkinson investigation and only about five or six of us have been on record publicly. And some folks probably have in their investigation, they might've shared things that they don't want to be public, right? So there's absolutely people that would not want their name associated. And there's people that I believe have participated with Congress that They want nothing to do with it. They don't want their name out there, but they're going to corroborate or they're going to help how they can. So I think there absolutely needs to be a level of protection. But again, with that common interest agreement, doesn't Dan Snyder already know all the people that participated in everything that they said? Yeah. Redactions would seem to be the, uh, uh, you know, the the mechanism here that would protect the identity. And it's not just redacting the names, redacting then some of the uh, identifying details around those individuals so that we wouldn't be able to guess who that person is. 
But certainly as to your story and some of the other public facing you know, victims, you'd certainly want to have your names associated with that report. And you want your narrative, your story, and what happened to you known to the public as part of an investigative report with factual findings. Are you ready to, to have that happen? We've been ready for that. I do think, though, that there's some, and I'm going to make some assumptions about some of the things that may have come through for the report. Chances are serious allegations or those directly involving Dan Snyder, there's probably very few witnesses, just as we saw with um, Tiffany Johnson's and how Jason Freeman's come forward. So I think depending on what's been reported, it does get very hard when there could be only a few people that actually were witnesses to it. And some of the witnesses in some instances might've been bad actors as well. So it's a very odd situation, but I think, I think Dan Snyder is probably very well aware of who all participated. Um, it's just a matter of whether or not people want those public details out there in the open, because this stuff is embarrassing. There's a lot of guilt and shame or there's, um, you know, there's PTSD attached to it. So I think the more this drags on, the harder the, it, it just becomes more um, emotionally damaging, frankly. So the question I had, you, you brought up the name and it came up once during the hearing. That was Jason Friedman. They didn't mention him by name, but one of the politicians at one point mentioned, you know, he was he was of the opinion uh, that, you know, we shouldn't be having a hearing today. It's a waste of time. This is all based on the comments of one disgruntled employee and you know, Megan, we've been following this closely. The one, quote unquote, one disgruntled employee that pertains to, um, you know, uh, cooking the books and the ticket revenue nonsense. It's pretty, I don't know, pretty blasphemous to call the allegations, the toxic workplace allegations, the sexual harassment allegations. It's pretty crazy to call that one disgruntled employee. So for those that were coming new to the hearing, like whatever politician that was, if I knew who it was, I, I'm not afraid to call him out. But right, like he just got it completely mixed up, right? I would, I would hope it was, it was a careless mistake, not, not an intentional one to make light of the, the volume of people that have come forward with, with respect to this particular hearing. Yeah, I think that goes back to one of my original points on, I think people are forgetting that there's actual lives associated here. And while some people leaving the organization might not have been the happiest or um, not realizing some of the abuses that went on or that they were even a victim of abuse, even if they were subjected to that environment for years, um, sometimes people don't know that until they're out of it. Um, so I think there's a little bit of carelessness on how some folks are referencing the actual people that are trying to do the right thing. That's been really hard to watch. So I, I have one more and then I'll, I'll kick it back to Dan. Um, among another, just another topic that uh, came up today that I wasn't aware of, you know, when we saw the actual physical dossier being waved in the air, like, look at this packet. Snyder's got dirt on everybody. He's got dirt on the attorneys and journalists and former employees. You know, we were having Megan a conversation offline and to whatever extent you're comfortable talking about it. Is it your understanding that you are one of the individuals named in, in that packet? Based on the 29 page memo, I am. I'm nosy. I'm, I'm curious like, what they found. But again, that's something I'm sure all of us wouldn't want out there publicly. I would like I would love for Congress to share privately with me whatever they pulled together. It's pretty wild to me that that they went to those lengths of trying to figure out how to either pull negative information or whatever could discredit our valid, you know, I just, I just wonder how they got it, right? Isn't that Snyder's dirt sheet? Like how did, did, did Snyder disclose that to Congress? Like that, that was my read on the situation. I thought I saw in the memo and I, I don't want to be misquoted, but I thought I saw that it was provided over by his attorneys, but I don't, I find that to be pretty shocking but I don't know factually, but that's what it looked like from the memo. Is that what you read as well? That's my understanding. It just, uh, it just seems, you know, Snyder is the guy that's not appearing, right? He's, he has to get subpoenaed from France. Uh, of the 400,000 some odd documents they provided, the John Gruden emails were not included. So of all things to be compliant on, providing the dirt sheet was not something that I would guess would be at the top of the list. So an interesting theory here could have been I probably even shouldn't even bring this up, but he could have, their attorneys could have provided that to some of those GOP committee members that then shared it with the other committee members. I don't know if that happened, but that easily could have happened because they could have used any of that in their commentary to try to discredit us during the, the hearing. Um, that would have been the only other thing, but that's a pretty, pretty risky thing. And obviously it got in the hands of Chairwoman Maloney. <laughs> 
So, but I hate the fact that those are the, the level of tactics. You're coming after these, these people that are brave and trying to actually do the genuine right thing. And he's, he's obviously pulling out all the stops to try to prevent more people from coming forward. Megan, you're named in this sort of dossier in several, in several places, and you were sort of part of, you know, ensnared in the shadow investigation that Snyder commissioned for some private investigators to conduct. Were you, were you aware of the level of the surveillance? Did any of this come as a surprise to you, or, you know, in terms of how recent it was? Uh, when I woke up this morning and I saw the Washington Post article, my, the entire trajectory of my day changed. It was like, I felt sick. I felt nauseated. It feels like a breach of privacy on top of like how much more do we have to deal with here? And is this just the beginning? I look at it as a sign of a weak and pathetic man that is scared. It was very, it was very, it, I wouldn't say it's shocking, but it was, it definitely caught me off guard this morning. And then when I read the 29 page memo. Obviously that happened right before the hearing. So it was like a bit of a domino effect between the Washington Post article last night, the one this morning, the 29 page memo. It's a lot to absorb. Okay. There, there have been reports about two new uh, instances of alleged sexual misconduct, one of which is under review or investigation by uh, Mary Jo White. And then there's a second report. Um, Do you have any faith that these investigations will lead to meaningful, truthful findings and ultimately the kind of NFL discipline that you've been seeking and the kind of justice that you've been seeking on behalf of the larger group. Do you have any faith in this process? I have faith in Congress. I have my hope in Congress. I think they've done a very nice, thorough job. I think there's more to come with, with what they've gathered. I also am very curious about the attorney general, specifically DC and Maryland that are doing investigations. I haven't heard anything about them, but I'm very curious what they might be going after. And then with Mary Jo White, um, I saw my attorney, Lisa Banks' statement uh, in Deborah Katz today, you know, she has mentioned that she's going to release those findings publicly. And I expect that that's what's going to happen. And you heard Roger Goodell state that today too. So I want to believe that they're going about this above board. Um, And if not, I think I think this has too much heat to ever simmer down now. It's, um, it's a matter of this, even though today was, um, it had ups and downs. I, I think it's a step forward in a big way, but yeah, I mean, we're, we're going to have to wait and see. Yeah. Um, are you afraid of any further repercussions from Dan Snyder, sure. the commanders of the NFL? You know, we just went through Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard, you know, anytime victims or alleged victims speak out. Now we have the precedent of, of this, sort of using powerful people, using the court process to silence others. A hundred percent. And I, I mentioned this, um, you know, the past two years, I, one of the very first things about putting my name on this was I'm scared for my safety, my reputation, smear campaigns, a billionaire, you know, I'm, we're messing with billions of dollars with the NFL. Now I've made mention that I would love for there to be protections for myself and others that have come forward in case down the road we're dealing with anything related to Dan Snyder and his his cronies. And I think, frankly, I think the NFL should provide those types of protections for folks like me, because it would be way too obvious to continue interfering right now with our lives. But we know him to be a vindictive person. And that's the part that I hope we don't have to deal with down the line. But it is scary. It's just like if I ever wanted to go back and work in professional sports. Am I completely, you know, never going to have that opportunity if I ever wanted it again? Like, I think about all of that. There's consequences to coming forward. And unfortunately, there hasn't been a lot of upside here. So I'm hoping that the upside is congressional legislation. Hopefully, Dan Snyder loses the team. I'd love to see a criminal investigation. And frankly, I think Roger Goodell needs to step down based on how he's handled this and other uh, other situations. So I guess the, the my last question, uh, Megan, you know, the I guess the breaking news, and if you were watching the hearing today, obviously, Dan Snyder is going to be subpoenaed next week. So it, it lends itself to some additional, at least one additional hearing on this particular topic. You know, we, we obviously talk a, a, a lot today. Um, we've spoken a lot about a lot of different issues, a lot of new facts that have come up. What are your expectations as someone that's been very close to this investigation, personally involved? 
What are your expectations for the next hearing, assuming Dan Snyder does come and adhere to a subpoena? I have no idea how to feel right now about the subpoena of Dan Snyder, whether or not he'll cooperate. And if he doesn't, what are the consequences? And my hope is that he cooperates. But, you know, we've unfortunately seen precedent previously recently of of folks not cooperating. I I really I don't really have a good answer for that right now. I think I need to wrap my my head around it a little bit more. I think he's shown that he thinks he's above the law right now. And he's doing everything he can to show the changes they've made in the organization and all of that. So I don't have, I don't have faith in Dan Snyder. So I, I don't really know how to properly answer that one. All right. Well, Megan, I can't thank you enough for uh, spending uh, your afternoon with us. It's been a busy day for you. You were watching the uh, congressional hearing, uh, which lasted for three, well, nearly three hours, and then uh, jumping on with us on Conduct Detrimental to talk about your experiences and your expectations and and, and, and provide some insight into, into your experience working with the commanders. I can't thank you enough. Uh, it was a pleasure having you on on Conduct Detrimental, and we, we want to have you back if and when there's a next hearing. But I have a sneaking suspicion that that next hearing might be delayed by a federal court lawsuit. And depending on how that plays out, we may or may not have a hearing, but if there is one, you'll be back 100%. Well, thank you so much. And we we appreciate the coverage. um, And I've learned a lot from your podcast. Thank you, Megan. Thank you. Bye. That interview was sponsored by Underdog Fantasy. You can head to them for DFS action, season long best ball fantasy events. Use our code CONDUCT for a $100 match bonus. Again, that's underdog fantasy. Use our code CONDUCT. Okay, Dan, so I thought Megan was excellent. Again, a two-time guest on our show. She's always welcome back. You know, I asked her right at the end how she felt about Dan Snyder being subpoenaed to testify next week. And we say next week, that's the exact term that was given to us, um, you know, from, from the floor. Next week is probably, Dan, in line with those comments that you had just made about running out the clock. That's why they're going to try to subpoena him very quickly. Um, Dan, I know a number of issues have arisen, but let let me give it to you with this. What are the ramifications if Dan Snyder does not adhere to this subpoena? If he blows it off, what could happen to him? Well, just like a witness who ignores a subpoena in a civil lawsuit, Congress has contempt powers and can, in fact, issue a contempt of Congress, which is a remedy, a sanction that could be enforced in court, Department of Justice. I mean, it could get very hairy, but I don't think Dan Snyder, like any other incalcitrant witness, is going to just sit back and wait for a congressional body to find him in contempt. I think upon, you know, because the likelihood of Dan Snyder voluntarily testifying upon receipt of a subpoena is basically tantamount to like when pigs fly, it's not going to happen. So once he's issued a subpoena, there's an immediate point of entry into the judicial system. And I think he'll avail himself of that uh, by filing suit next week in federal district court. Why wait for punishment? Why wait to be held in contempt? That's not a good thing. I mean, the word contempt kind of follows you around and it it almost sounds like it's a loss, right? You've been found in contempt of Congress. I mean, even Donald Trump, even the Mazar's law firm and all these witnesses uh, that uh, were reluctant to testify in the impeachment proceedings, what did they do when they received subpoenas to testify? They didn't wait for a contempt citation. They filed lawsuits to sort of, you know, clarify the issue around executive privilege. And I think Dan Snyder in all likelihood will file a law- lawsuit. It could be ASAP like next week because the subpoena might have a rapid turnaround time. So he would file a declaratory judgment action in federal district. He's in France, He's in France Dan. He's in France. I don't know how he's supposed to do anything. Uh, you know, miraculously, <laughs> he has a, a battery of lawyers all over Washington, D.C., that can take dictation and write an affirmation or a declaration and court file it. And he's gonna raise two issues. He's gonna raise the issues as to the permissible scope of the congressional investigation as intruding beyond the legislative function and becoming more and more of a, an executive branch function of conducting an enforcement proceeding. And he's also gonna say this stuff is, so much of this is protected by the attorney-client privilege, and then that's going to raise a separate battle as to whether the attorney-client privilege even applies in a congressional proceeding, because there's this precedent going both ways on that, and most notably, the most recent 
U.S. Supreme Court decision in Trump versus Mazars USA does raise the specter that the attorney-client privilege can be invoked in a congressional investigation. But previous to that decision, which, by the way, that language is dicta, it had always been recognized that the committee chairperson has the discretion as to whether or not to recognize the attorney-client privilege. So those two battles or those two key issues are going to be teed up. So long story short, he's not going to wait for the other shoe to drop. The issuance of the subpoena will open up the courthouse door for Dan Snyder. So the other issue that was not, uh, I don't think addressed as, as much as you and I would have liked the hearing, the stories that we've heard for, you know, year and a half, two years, and it's really been since July of 2020 that you and I have been covering. It's been a long time, um, you know, but I've seen it a couple of times, right? The owners are counting the votes. They need to get to 24 votes. They're going to do it, right? Um, what Roger Goodell did not do, and at the beginning of this podcast, I explained that there were three scenarios, right? One where Goodell deflected, one where he threw the commanders under the bus, and one where he threw Snyder under the bus. He definitely didn't do three. He did a little bit of one and two. Now, for three, we saw um, Adam Silver uh, in the not-too-distant past really make it a point uh, that he wanted to uh, ban Donald Sterling, former owner of the, the Los Angeles Clippers, wanted to ban him from the league. And it was really an Adam Silver directed charge. Maybe there were some owners behind the scenes, but Adam Silver was certainly out in front of it, directing owners, being very vocal about what he wanted. Now, for Donald Sterling, it never got to an NBA vote. Um, you know, for the NFL's purposes, it could be put to a vote. But you did not hear the type of criticism that some, you know, thought might come today, that Goodell would really kind of lambast Snyder and lay into him and say, this is not the way an owner could conduct himself. There was a comment from one of the politicians about how hands-on Dan Snyder was and the at least what the investigation seemed to reveal is that Dan Snyder, contrary to what we might've heard before, was not this hands-off owner, that he was very hands-on with this scenario. I think the, the phrase they used, he had both hands on. So he was a very engaged owner. So this is not a scenario where I think Snyder, they're gonna let him off the hook with respect to Congress, say, I wasn't involved, I didn't know what was going on. At least the picture that, that Congress is going to paint, it seems like, that Dan Snyder knew exactly what was going on uh, and that he failed to act. So Dan, I'll, I'll turn to you. Do you read Goodell's comments today is that there is never going to be a vote? Because I, I think this was his opportunity to say it if he wanted to send that message, right? Well, I mean, I, I come from the world of like sports wagering legislation. And, and I can tell you that committee chairpersons, which, you know, I, I'll analogize this to Commissioner Goodell. They know going in whether they have the votes to pass legislation. If they don't have the votes, they're not going to bring it to a vote. They're not, they're not going to bring it to a floor vote because they don't want to have, uh, you know, sort of the adverse action come down the pike. So I think Roger Goodell, in a way, you know, kind of read the tea leaves and, and, and caucused the individual owners as to, hey, you know, what do you, what do you want to do here? And if he felt there was this groundswell of support to force Dan Snyder to sell his interest in the team, uh, he may have gone that route. Uh, but obviously the other owners, if it's Snyder today, it could be one of, one of the others next year or the year after. And they don't want to establish the precedent where it's so easy for the NFL commissioner to just sort of, you know, push that lever and recommend to the executive committee that an, or, that an owner be forced to sell his interest in the team. He may have to do that soon enough with Stephen Ross if these tanking allegations have any, uh, you know, bear any fruit. And we're gonna find that out hopefully over the course of the next year, depending on whether the case is arbitrated or not, but that's, that's a podcast for another day. Uh, but this is a typical excuse that owners make of professional sports teams when there's all this misconduct that occurs below them on the org chart. Mark Cuban, who was a pretty hands-on owner for so many years, becomes you know, clueless as to this culture of, of misconduct occurring within his organization. And you, you know, that, that's, what, 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 that's what owners are going to be saying when faced with accusations that there's this toxic workplace environment. It worked for, it worked for Mark Cuban. He wasn't forced to sell the team and that convinced uh, NBA commissioner Adam Silver. So that's Dan Snyder's story, but it seems like it's betrayed by everything we've heard from witnesses, what we heard today in Congress and what the truth probably lies, and we'll never really get to the bottom of it unless and until Dan Snyder is presented with materials to you know, answer for himself. And we could, be, we could be a long ways away from having Dan Snyder testifying in front of this congressional committee. If it's gonna happen, it has to happen with quick court action, 
and an expedited judicial review process. So there is an outside chance that this actually can come to fruition before the end of this calendar year, but it's going to require, you know, expedition by a federal district court judge. Um, so, Dan, I think I'm good to end it here. Um, I want to give a big shout out and a big thank you to Colin Farrell, who uh, he's the only non-lawyer that's on Team Conic Detrimental. And, uh, you know, he came highly recommended that he was a, a tech guru. He knew how to live stream and all this fun stuff. And Colin, uh, as many know, hosts our show, our, our debate show, Bench Points. But he came uh, as good as advertised today with our conduct cast, very similar to the Manning cast, except instead of their but last better. name both being... Manning, Dan. <laughs> the, the first names were both Dan. So in another world, we could have, we could have called it a Dan cast. That, that might have actually been better for, for t-shirt purposes. But yeah, Dan, shout out to Conlon. He did a great job. Shout out to all of our guests. Shout out to our, as crazy as it sounds, Dan, our first endeavor, 2,000 people. And it's almost like when we did the town halls, we had a, like a thousand registrants. We do a, uh, you know, a conduct cast. We have 2,000. So the weirder and more in the weeds we get, it seems like we get more feedback uh, and more people turning out. So I think that means that we should start getting uh, into some more deeper niche issues. What do you say, Dan? Well, I, I think the phrase that I would use, and I've heard a lot of you know people say this, content is king. Well, if content is king, live content is double king, right? You have live broadcasts like this, live shows, town halls. It lives on in perpetuity because we had 2,400 people live during the podcast. But here's some news for you, Dan. If you go back to the YouTube page, those numbers are growing because people are watching the replay on YouTube. So it was 2,400 a few hours ago. Now it's getting closer to 3,000. And I think there's a, there's, there's a demand for the kind of live content that we've been able to do in the past vis-a-vis uh, -vis the town hall and the St. Louis Rams relocation lawsuit. And now the sort of conduct cast of the Manning, uh, conduct cast of the congressional hearing today. So I think we're establishing a, a benchmark or a beachhead for ourselves in providing live commentary on real time events unfolding, could be in courts, could be in Congress. But I think these are gonna now be the exception rather than the rule. I, I can't wait until the next one. So let's make these a regular a periodic feature of, of, of conduct detrimental. There's no shortage of topics for sure. Credit to you, your idea, your crazy idea that was crazy enough that it worked, uh, and all the credit to you. Conlon, uh, though, reminder, man. Conlon. No, no. Conlon is the, is Conlon the bomb. He, Dan, made, he executed this. You, you guys both get the credit. I just showed up and I uh, put on some nice clothes today. Okay. Podcast sponsored by Themis Bar Review. We talked about subpoenas. We talked about discovery. We talked about, actually, we didn't talk about in the show, the potential uh, removal of the NFL's antitrust exemption. Uh, you know, another another fun topic. Um, but for all things law, if you are a young lawyer listening to this, if you are someone that's looking and you're hearing someone studying for the bar, ask them if they're using Themis Bar Review, because if they're not, chances are they are absolutely miserable because any other bar prep company is not doing it as fun, as engaging as Themis. Head to themisbar.com slash con detrimental. Or if you're looking to sign up and you want some money off, just message us and we will give you the hookup. Okay, Dan, uh, Themis, Underdog, live hearings, Megan Invert. I'm around ready to pass out, but I know, Dan, you and I, we got a lot of media hits these next couple of days. So uh, sports law is king, content is king, and, yeah. and life is good in the world of sports law. Well, this was our busiest week ever on Conduct Detrimental, and even going back to late last week with Oliver Luck and... Uh, you know, the, this trio of, of episodes with Deshaun Watson's you know, settlement agreement, the live uh, conduct cast, and now Megan Eb Embert. I mean, I'm getting the itch to do a lot more of these. I think we're hitting our stride. Uh, but thank, just thank God for football. Football is really uh, one of the most fascinating uh, storylines that we could ever have on conduct detrimental. So we have to thank Roger Goodell for creating a firestorm of legal issues over the last 15 years of his tenure, probably responsible for me even being on Twitter. So I don't want to see Roger Goodell go anywhere. We criticize him. We lambaste him for not having a law degree, for making all these stupid decisions, but he's been great for business. Thank you to our guests again, to our 2000 viewers, and thank you to Roger Goodell. With that said, from Dan, myself, the Conduct Detrimental family, we will see you all next time on another episode of Conduct Detrimental. <laughs>